Well, good morning, everyone. Happy Friday morning. Welcome back to Morning Musings and Now TV. My name is Don K. Preston. I'm the president of Preterist Research Institute of Ardmore, Oklahoma. And boy, I appreciate you 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 being with me. I can't even talk to us this morning. So anyway, I really, really appreciate you being with me. Um, I hope you're well. I hope everything is going well with you here in uh, Ardmore, Oklahoma. My wife and I are very, very much involved in the construction of our new office space that I've mentioned to you before. Uh, our contractor is doing a great job. They're making great progress. <gasps> Pardon me. It's still probably going to be maybe um, maybe a month, month and a half before we can move in. But I was just out there uh, looking at it, and they really are making good progress. And uh, let me say again how much I appreciate those of you who have been so kind and generous enough to help us uh, with the funding of this project. It's, uh, it is obviously expensive. It was not in our financial plans, but thanks to some of you, we are getting it done and uh, we're going to see it through one way or the other. And uh, again, we just really, really appreciate those of you who have been able to step up and to be able to help us uh, at this very, very critical time in our ministry. Now then, I've shared with you the last couple of weeks the challenge of Christ and the book of Revelation. I do not know of another book in all of the New Testament that more people appeal to commonly and frequently to support a yet future coming of the Lord, judgment and resurrection, than the book of Revelation. Uh, I've shared with, with you some anecdotes. And I mean, I, I just hear from people all the time and over the last few weeks of this, a uh, few days of this week, as a matter of fact, I have had have any number of people contact me and say, well, Preston, you are wrong in your view of eschatology because Revelation says, Revelation teaches. The book of Revelation contains the following. Well, that's all fine and good, and they may, they may in fact be true that the book of Revelation talks about the things that they are mentioning, such as the Great Tribulation, uh, the Battle of Armageddon, the 144,000. But because the book of Revelation mentions those things does not mean that these people who are appealing to the book of Revelation for a yet future eschaton are applying the book of Revelation properly, rightfully, and truthfully. And that's really what it's all about, ladies and gentlemen. I, I have mentioned to you before, the entire subject of eschatology is all about hermeneutic. I don't know when precisely, <clears throat> pardon me, and I, I'm not real sure exactly why precisely. Bible students begin going to the book of Revelation and believing that it had nothing to do with the first century people, first century events, and first century fulfillment. Believing instead that it absolutely must refer to the end of time, the end of the Christian age. Again, I, I'm not quite certain exactly when that started taking place, I do know this. I do know that a great deal of the misunderstanding about eschatology as a whole did begin in the first century. And it began, we find traces of it, as early as Romans chapter 11. When the Gentiles, as early as 56, 57 A.D., we're already saying God is through with Israel. Israel's last days have come and gone. Israel has been cut off. Now listen, ladies and gentlemen, nothing is more fundamentally involved in a proper understanding of biblical eschatology than understanding Israel's role in eschatology. That's why it's so perplexing to me when I see 
read and hear dispensationalists talk about Israel, Israel, Israel. Okay, that's fine. But then they rip that discussion completely out of the first century and they apply it two centuries later when text after text after text places fulfillment in the first century. Likewise, when I hear, as I did growing up, when I hear Bible teachers say, oh, God was through with Israel at the cross. Listen to me very carefully. In the all-millennial world in which I was raised, in the churches of Christ, a fundamental doctrine is God was through with Israel at the cross. God was through with the old law at the cross. Beginning on Pentecost, God began dealing with the church, separate, distinct, and apart from, independent from, God's old covenant promises made to old covenant Israel. Look, I, I was raised believing that. I was raised teaching that. I was raised debating that. Until it hit me one day, huh, if God was through with Israel at the cross, and if the, if, if the Old Testament had no application after the cross, how could Peter on the day of Pentecost say that the, that the events of Pentecost were the fulfillment of God's old covenant promises made to old covenant Israel? Ooh, that's a bit of a problem, isn't it? And then I realized that Paul said in Acts chapter 24, 14 to 15, Acts 25, 8 and following, Acts 26, 9 through 23, that his eschatological hope, his hope of the resurrection, was nothing. D do you catch that? Nothing but the hope of Israel found in Moses, the law, and the prophets. And, I mean, it, it hit me like a ton of bricks. <clears throat> if God was through with Israel at the cross, if God was through with the Old Testament at the cross, how could it be that Paul, years after the cross, said that his eschatological hope was nothing but the reiteration of God's old covenant promises made to old covenant Israel. Something was wrong here. And so I'm somewhat distressed when I continue to read and hear modern day preachers say God was through with Israel at the cross. God was through the Old Testament at the cross. And then when you confront them with these facts that I've just shared, all of a sudden, I'm the heretic. I'm the false teacher for saying uh, eschatology is about the fulfillment of God's old covenant promises to Israel. All of a sudden, I'm the false teacher. Like I said, folks, we got a problem here. And then I hear the post-millennialists say, oh, Israel. Okay, Israel has been cut off for the time being but we're waiting the time in which at the end of the Christian age, they're going to be converted as a nation. They're going to be converted and ushered into the millennial reign of Christ. Oh, wait, we're already in the millennial reign of Christ, uh, so that doesn't quite work, so we got to think of something else. I want you to consider <clears throat> if the view that I espoused as a young man in the churches of Christ <clears throat> if that view was correct, then Paul was absolutely wrong when he said, Romans chapter 9, has God cast off his people whom he foreknew? God forbid. He has not cast off his people. Folks, literally, do you catch the power of that? If you're a member of the churches of Christ, you were raised believing, as I was raised believing and teaching and debating, that God was through with Israel at the cross. What are you going to do with Romans chapter 9, 1 and following? What are you going to do with Romans chapter 10? What are you going to do with Romans chapter 11? Because in those chapters, Paul is affirming in the clearest terms possible, God was not yet, at the time he wrote in approximately 57 A.D., God was not through with Israel. Now, it was going to be before long, 
but he still wasn't through with them at the time that he wrote, meaning he wasn't through with the old covenant when he, when he wrote Romans. How could Paul be saying, on the one hand, God was through with the Old Testament at the cross, then turn around in the book of Romans and say he was anticipating the fulfillment of the Old Testament in the very near future. And it was being fulfilled even as he wrote. How can he do that? Now, in spite of all that, <clears throat> as I mentioned, commentator after commentator, when they talk about eschatology, where do they go? They go directly to the book of Revelation. So, the book of Revelation presents to us a tremendous challenge in light of the challenge of Christ. Over the last two weeks, I've shared with you the book of Revelation tells us right straight up, no uncertain terms, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show to his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. And he said it signified it through his servant to the seven churches, of course, saying, these things are at hand. Now then, let's go back and let's cover a little bit more what we touched on last week. Listen, it really doesn't matter in one way. It doesn't matter what else you may think that you may perceive of, conceive of, imagine. <laughs> If what you believe about the book of Revelation violates Revelation 1, 1 to 3, then your interpretation is wrong. Look again at Revelation 1, 1 and what it says. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God, that's the Father, gave to him to show to his servants things which must shortly come to pass. Now, in the Greek, the term which must shortly come to pass is from the Greek word intarkai. Several attempts are made to negate, to escape the eminence of that language. So in today's program, I want to focus on that term in Tokai, and if we have time today, we'll get to verse 3, where it says the time is at hand. Now, I, I'm not going to try to get in depth on the time is at hand, because I want to spend one program just on the linguistics of that statement, the time is at hand. Boy, it's important. <laughs> okay, so, the Father told Jesus to tell John to tell the churches these things must shortly come to pass. Now, many years ago in the previous century, that makes it sound like it was even longer, doesn't it? When William Hendrickson wrote a book, Worthy is the Lamb, and in that book, he spent about that much time discussing the language, these things must shortly come to pass. He literally gave it only lip service. And then he extrapolated completely, totally, centuries upon centuries upon centuries away from the language of must shortly come to pass, and applied the vision of the book of Revelation to events that had nothing to do with John, nothing to do with the seven churches, nothing to do with the first century, nothing to do with these things must shortly come to pass. Philip Morrow wrote a book, These Things Must Shortly Come to Pass. When I very first saw the title of that book, and I've always liked Philip Morrow 
as an author. I liked him a whole lot more before I read that book. <clears throat> I mean, my goodness gracious. He spent so much time setting the stage. These things must shortly come to pass. It can't be a long time off. It, it is near. It's imminent. It's, it's coming shortly. And then you know what he did? He applied the predictions of Revelation to his 20th century generation, thus violating the language of these things that must shortly come to pass. Now, let me give a little bit of lip service, if you please, to an argument that is so commonly offered. When people read the statement, these things must shortly come to pass, they tell us, well, we have to understand because this is the Father. And God doesn't see time like we do. Now, I discussed this last week, but I want to tell you what, folks. Once we grasp the reality that God can tell time, that God does tell time, and God tells time truthfully, and God tells time truthfully in the manner and with the definitions of time that man understands, and God expects man to understand his time words in the way that man communicates time words. Now, let me say this. There are occasions on which God uses words figurative figuratively, metaphorically, and symbolically. The number three may or may not mean the literal number three. It may mean perfection. The number 10, the number 12, the number 100, the number 1,000. Now, you and I as Westerners, by and large, we think in literal terms when we hear the number 100 or 1,000, and when people read the number 200 million army, man army, it's going to be the largest army that the world has ever seen. There's never been a, there has never been an army of 200 million people. Uh, see, so that proves Revelation is future. We fail to understand, ladies and gentlemen, Hebraic writers used numbers to convey mental images, not numbers. And in fact, it's easily demonstrated, easily demonstrated that biblical writers used large numbers, really, really large numbers, when they had much, much, much smaller numbers in mind. I'm not going to take the time to develop that, but it is undoubtedly true. So, again, we are told, you know, God said those things must shortly come to pass, but God doesn't see time like we do. And let me say this as kindly as possible, that is absolutely, totally false. God expects you and me to understand what he meant when he said, these things must shortly come to pass. So what we are often told then by way of objection is, well, <clears throat> what that means is, in fact, I, I had a formal YouTube debate with a Messianic Jew a few years ago. When I began to point these things out, all of these time statements, he kept repeating, what that means is, what that's saying is, when it begins to come to pass, it will come to pass quickly. You know, you can't find a statement like that in the New Testament. Did you know that nowhere in the New Testament do we find a statement? Well, the, these things are far off right now, but when they finally start coming to pass, they're going to come, come to pass quickly, shortly and soon. Well, I kept pointing that out, and I kept challenging the young man, give me a text that says that. He became noticeably perturbed, noticeably upset. And finally, he, he admitted, he says, it doesn't say it, but that's what it means. 
And my question to him was, how do you know that's what it means when that's not what it says? Now listen, ladies and gentlemen, the Greek had all sorts of words for saying when it begins to come to pass, it will happen quickly. None of those words are used. There were all sorts of Greek words to convey the idea these things will begin to come to pass shortly, be fulfilled over an extended period of time, and then ultimately fulfilled. They didn't use any of those words. So when the New Testament uses the Greek term in Tokai, these things must shortly come to pass, Revelation 1.1. What did it mean? Well, that Greek term only appears about seven times in the New Testament. And let me give you just a couple of examples, okay? In Luke chapter 18, Jesus talked about how his apostles were going to be persecuted. And they were to pray for the Lord to come and to bring vindication for them. And he told a parable. The parable is very often called the, the parable of the importunate widow. And it means, and Jesus says, okay, there was once a widow in a town who was uh, taken advantage of financially by someone. She went to a judge and said, avenge me on my adversary. That judge did not fear man or God. So he dismissed her. She kept coming back. Avenge me on my adversary. He would dismiss her. She kept coming and kept coming and kept coming back until finally the judge says, well, I don't fear God or man, but this woman is wearing me out. <laughs> Therefore, I will avenge her. And Jesus said, will not God avenge his elect, that's the suffering elect being persecuted that Jesus had been talking about, including his apostles. Will not God avenge his elect who cry out to him day and night? Yes, verily I say unto you, he will avenge them speedily. Okay, so people say, well, all that Jesus was saying was that you know, when God finally gets around to avenging the martyrs, he's going to do it with speed. It doesn't tell us when he was going to avenge the martyrs, just the nature or the speed with which he would do it once he finally gets around to doing it. Well, you see, that won't work, ladies and gentlemen, because in Matthew chapter 23, 29 and following, Jesus spoke to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And he said, which of the prophets have you not slain? Actually, that's borrowing from Acts chapter 7, but it applies here as well. You bear witness to yourselves that you are the sons of those who killed the prophets, because you say, had we been alive in the days of our fathers, we would not have slain the prophets. Thereby you bear witness to yourselves that you are the sons of those who killed the prophets. You garnish the tombs of the prophets. And he said, fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. Behold, I send to you prophets, wise men, scribes. Some of them you shall scourge and, and crucify and chase from city to city that upon you may come all of the righteous blood of all of the righteous shed on the earth from righteous Abel unto Zacharias, son of Barachias, whom you slew between the temple and the altar. Verily I say unto you, all of these things shall come upon this generation. Ladies and gentlemen, could language be any clearer? What generation of people was Jesus talking to? What generation was he talking about? And yet, once again, guess what? People say, well, you know what, the word, this, uh, the term this generation, uh, it, it doesn't mean a time frame. It means this kind of people. No, it doesn't mean that. Or what Jesus really meant was the generation that I'm talking about, uh, 
when it finally comes on the scene, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, that generation, not this one, but that generation, that's the one he's talking about. No, it is not. You see, I call these kind of arguments argumentum ad desperatum. That's a non-Latin Latin term that I coined. No, it's not a Latin term. But it describes the desperation of people trying to avoid the force of what Jesus said. They try to make time words, ladies and gentlemen, mean anything except what they mean. At hand doesn't mean soon. Shortly doesn't mean quickly. This generation doesn't mean this generation. Quickly, shortly, and soon, in a very, very little while, doesn't mean any of that. It can mean a million years. It's argumentum a desperatum. Now, here's my point. In Matthew 23, 29 to 36, Jesus emphatically, explicitly said, all of the blood of all of the martyrs, including the blood of his apostles, that are standing right there listening, that are going to be killed by the Jews of that generation. Jesus said the generation in which he was living, the generation that would kill his apostles, the generation that would kill his prophets, would be the generation to, to fill up the measure of their sin, and it would be that very generation that filled up the measure of their sin that would be destroyed in judgment when he vindicated his apostles. Now, that means it was Jesus' generation that would witness the vindication, experience the vindication of the martyrs. What did Jesus say in Luke chapter 18? Will not God avenge his martyrs who cry out to him day and night? Yes, verily, he will avenge them speedily. Okay, speedily. That was going to be in that generation. 